So hello everybody. I'm gonna I've got two screens up, so if I start looking to the right, that's why that is. And today I'm gonna be talking to you about the third chapter of my PhD thesis. And this was using surface waves um, to image melt storage in the crust beneath the northern East African rift. And in particular, it's to use uh, love and Rayleigh waves from ambient noise um, to do tomography and get uh, radial anisotropy in this case. And this image is taken in Ethiopia at the Corbetti Caldera. So the two main aims of this chapter were firstly to investigate the shape of melt within the crust. So look at whether we thought that melt was um, being stored as sills or as dikes. And also to look at how the shape of melt changed with progressive rifting and if it did change or not. So say we had sills in one area and more dikes in another. So see if there was a transition. So some of this work has been looked at already. Um, this is a paper by uh, James Hammond in 2014 uh, where they've um, looked at different sources of anisotropy and you can see that at mantle depths there and this is uh, along the rift so this is beneath the plateau and this is going down into the rift you can see that there have good constraints at mantle depths but once we get to crustal depths well they think that um, it are some lower crustal melts in sills and also some um, dikes rather beneath some of the magmatic segments the constraints here are a bit um, harder to define here they're based on um, SKS splitting results um, from local earthquakes, um, which are focused to small areas, and also from a surface wave study that was in the main Ethiopian rift, the crustal results. So what I wanted to do was generate one model that allowed comparison at all stages of the rift for all crustal depths. So the region I'm looking at is the northern East African rift, so focusing in on uh, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Yemen, um, and Djibouti. Um, this region here and in this region uh, volcanism started approximately 45 million years ago when we had uh, the uh, African superplume impinging on the base of the plate. We then had volcanism continued but the main flood basalt uh, volcanism event occurred 31 to 29 million years ago and the extent of this is outlined in the blue colour here. It's mainly off beneath the Ethiopian plateau and also beneath the main Ethiopian rift. Now, rifting in this region started approximately coeval with the flood basalt volcanism. And in this region, we have the Afar Triple Junction, where the Red Sea Rift, Gulf of Aden Rift, and the main Ethiopian Rift all meet in Afar. It's also quite a complex area um, in terms of crustal thickness. We have some of the thinnest uh, crust here in the Danakul Depression, where the crust is 16 kilometres thick. And so this tells us that while we do have rifting, we have not gone to full uh, seafloor spreading because it's still 16 kilometers thick and not uh, ocean crustal thicknesses. Um, in the Afar region, we have crust that's about 20 to 25 kilometers thick, getting a bit thicker um, from 25 to 35 kilometers thick, and then 35 to 45 kilometers thick in the Ethiopian plateau. And these results come from various receiver function studies. Now the data I use is uh, from uh, seismometers present throughout um, the region. We've got good coverage, including beneath the Ethiopian plateau, which is a newly added uh, network that hasn't been used for tomography up until this point. And we've used stations that are present from 1999 to 2017. Um, and you can see that we have very good coverage in the rifting areas. Apart from we don't have any OBS stations in the Red Sea Rift or the Gulf of Aden, or stuff out into the Southeastern Plateau or Somalian Plateau. Um, and we want to use these for ambient noise tomography. Now, some of you may not be aware of what ambient noise is and what ambient noise tomography is, so I'll just give a brief overview. And ambient noise is kind of the background vibrations of the Earth, and this can be generated either from the rotation of the Earth, the interaction of ocean waves, or also local noise sources, such as uh, weathers, rivers, um, and also stuff like truck noise uh, is now being used as a uh, source. But what I'm interested in is the um, primary and secondary microseism, and these are generated from ocean waves. The primary microseism is about half the power of the secondary microseism, and this is where we have an instant ocean wave interacting with shallow bathymetry at coastlines, sends out a um, seismic wave, which is then recorded on a detector, say here. The secondary microseism is twice the power because it's the interaction of two ocean waves, again sends out some acoustic energy down to the sea floor, and then this wave propagates out and is again recorded on our detectors on over here and here. 
And what this looks like initially is just a noisy waveform. We have nothing coherent in here. But it turns out if we cross-correlate a detector here with a detector here, we can get a coherent uh, cross-correlation function that Tim showed earlier for the Galicia margin, as an example. And um, this gives us an approximation of the Green's function. And what this is, it gives us an indication of the seismic properties of the Earth between these two stations. Um, so what I use is both uh, usually just the vertical component to get the uh, to extract the Rayleigh wave information, but if we use the north and east components, we can also extract the love wave components. And once we have both of these for phase velocity, we can invert both of these for absolute shear velocity. If I just show you what the phase velocities look like, you can see these red colours which indicate a slower velocity and blue colours which indicate a faster velocity. Slower velocities in red can be caused by uh, changes in composition, so more felsic compositions, uh, increases in temperature, and also from the presence of fluids. So in contrast, faster blue colours are caused by more mafic compositions, lower temperatures, and a lack of fluids. And broadly, we have similar structures. We can see that we have uh, slower velocities in the main Ethiopian rift and beneath the uh, Ethiopian plateau in this region. And then for the Rayleigh waves, we see a uh, faster zone here and also it here. However, in the love waves, what's most noticeable is uh, the slower zone here and also a faster velocity zone in the main Ethiopian rift. So once I invert these for um, shear velocity, um, and then this is what the results look like, we see that the Rayleigh waves are always slower than the love waves. Inverting for absolute shear velocity, we find that the vertical component, on average, the vertical shear velocity is always weaker than the uh, horizontally aligned radial uh, shear velocity. And we see that this is significant from 5 to 30 kilometers depth, suggesting that we, have rate, we require anisotropy at these depths. If I show the absolute shear wave velocity models now, again remembering uh, slow velocities are red, we find the slowest velocities again are beneath the main Ethiopian rift and Ethiopian plateau. Um, these are average from 5 to 20 kilometers and these ones from 21 to 40 kilometers. And these slow velocities are slow enough to require melt. Compositional changes can only account for about 0.1 kilometers per second change from the global average and um, temperature changes um, would need to be in excess of 500 degrees C here, which while we do have increased temperatures in the mantle of about 100 to 200 degrees C, these are two, what we require to get the velocities this slow are too, uh, are too much. So we require the um, presence of partial, of fluids, most likely partial melt because we have volcanism in this region. But then that also suggests that we require it beneath the Ethiopian plateau, which is off rift. We also find that the fastest velocities are beneath the Afar region here and also the Western plateau. If I show you the anisotropy, the radial anisotropy results now, um, the colours now represent uh, positive values are, and red colours are horizontally aligned anisotropy, so horizontal structures like this, whereas blue colours uh, in here are vertically aligned. And what we see is that predominantly the reds and yellow colours show that we've got predominantly horizontally aligned radial anisotropy, which given the average was dominantly uh, horizontally aligned, uh, horizontal VSH was strongest, that doesn't seem surprising. However, we do see See beneath the Earth Alley magmatic segment, um, this area of um, vertically aligned radial anisotropy beneath the Earth Alley magmatic segment, which we'll move on to in a minute. So, bringing us back to those questions, what is the shape of melt within the crust? Well, as I said, the horizontally aligned anisotropy seems to be present across most of the region, and certainly beneath the main Ethiopian rift and also beneath the Ethiopian plateau, which we said had to require melt. It suggests that we've got an inherently la horizontally layered structure with uh, sills forming in this region. Particularly at um, this, uh, the mid to upper crustal mantle depths, we seem to have dominantly horizontally aligned sills. In contrast, beneath the Earth to magmatic segment, um, we've got vertically aligned uh, anisotropy and we have a lava lake in this region. So this suggests that melt maybe is stored as dikes beneath this area. Well, what's interesting is how um, this changes with depth, and we see that for the vertically aligned anisotropy, this still seems to be the same strength, suggesting that potentially these vertically 
uh, lined radial anisotropy in the form of dikes and maybe microcracks are present from the uh, mantle up through the crust and also to the surface in the form of the Earth's uh, lava lake and other regions in here. In contrast, we we'll see the horizontally an aligned anisotropy is weaker, but the velocities beneath this region are still slow. So this suggests we still have melt, but maybe it's not stored, uh, it's stored as a combination of sills, because we still have radial anisotropy, and also more uniform melt bodies. What we also know, if I move back to this, um, to the mid to upper crustal slice, is that radial anisotropy in, becomes weaker along the rift. We have the strongest horizontally aligned anisotropy in the rift here, becoming weaker here and even vertically aligned in this region. And potentially this is showing a change in melt storage with the earlier stages of rifting here to the latest stages of rifting in this region. So this is a slide, uh, this is an image from my um, thesis, so, but what we're focusing on is 10 to 40 kilometers depth in this region for where the anisotropy is. And what we find uh, for our final conclusions are that we require radial anisotropy from five to 30 kilometers in the depth. And because we have horizontally aligned anisotropy um, dominating across much of the crust, suggesting that we've got an inherently layered structure, which for most of this area is likely formed, uh, is likely linked to storage of sills. The radial anisotropy is strongest at mid to upper crustal depths, and this seems to be um, in, similar to some previous studies, particularly magnetotellurics um, and off rift uh, near the, beneath the Ethiopian plateau, finding mid-crustal structures about 20 kilometers depth. And potentially what we're seeing is that early in the rifting um, process in this region, melt seems to be intruded and stored as sills. And as rifting advances to kind of larger, wider rifts, the melt seems to be becoming focused to the rift axis and also um, intruded as uh, vertical dikes. Um, so thank you, that's me. <laughs> great, thank you very much Emma, that's, that's great. Um, any questions, uh, feel free to text in again. I've had a request from Cindy to ask a question. So Cindy, are you there? Yes, and, and I'm really excited that Emma has discovered pennies beneath the um, <coughs> Ethiopian plateau. Yeah, it's quite a few um, of them. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm teasing. Um, um, so here's my question. In the beginning, and, and it's interesting that you're at an oceanographic institute approaching the ocean continent boundary, perhaps from that perspective. In, in the early part, you were talking about thickness of crust as an indication of, of its composition or the process that creates it. And, and I think in a way, at the, both the Gulf of um, Tadjura and in the Erta Ale area, given that you have even more evidence for um, crustal scale dike intrusion zones that are creating new columns of basaltic and gabbroic crust that is oceanic in na nature that you know where we can start to parse out the process that creates the crust separate from like excess magmatism that enables a thicker than uh, or slow plate velocity slow opening velocities um, do you want to comment on that? Um, yeah, I'd say that that's correct. Um, it definitely seems like, um, because we know there is melt there, we were a bit confused when we saw that we had um, the faster velocities in that region. The, um, uh, if I, do I have that? These were some of the results we were starting to see. This is from um, a joint inversion, but you can see that, and this is isotropic. We were really surprised that we were starting to get these very fast velocity zones here um, when we know that there is melt. So the, it's definitely going to be tied to the variations in the crustal thickness and the more mafic compositions here. So the radial anisotropy really gave us an indication. So this is now the uh, anisotropic slices. It's now giving us an indication of kind of the melt um, how the melt is stored and also tying in with the geochemistry suggesting that there's um uh less crustal residence times in these positions we are starting to get understand the processes that are occurring here so, so so what you're saying is that it has to be almost entirely mafic material to account for the velocities or the lateral variations so it, yeah. it's thick oceanic cool thanks yes. great thank you We've had a question from Leanne Shrogi. Uh, Leanne, are you there? 
Leanne, would you like to read out your question? If you're not there or don't have a microphone, I can read it out instead. Okay, no word from Leanne, so I'll read out the question. So how well do you know dike alignment and how is it related to extensional stress directions? Oh, um, so I'd say that I can only tell from the radial anisotropy that something's either horizontally aligned or vertically aligned. I can't say if it's tilted. Um, that's not what I can comment on here. Um, so we're hopefully doing azimuthal anisotropy and then we'll get an idea of orientation of um, dikes and alignment that way. Um, with the uh, stresses, there was a model by uh, Macaferi that would suggest that um, the stresses and the narrow rift, um, so if we had the main Ethiopian rift in here, a narrow rift, um, the stresses would allow melt to be present, um, intrude into the rift here as horizontal sails, but also off rift beneath the Ethiopian plateau, which is potentially the stresses allowed for this. Whereas in contrast, beneath the, um, in the Afar region, the stresses were more allowing for dike intrusions in this modeling study um, without presence off rift. So um, that's as much as I know on the stresses. I need to read into those in more detail. Um, works in prep so I'm still looking into the stresses but that's what I know at the minute. <laughs> Great okay thank you very much.